And you know, I don't know how to do it. I So if you didn't understand uh, what that means, in uh, Yanam Nadofo in the Akan language in Ghana is brothers and sisters and loved ones, and Yama Akwaba, Akwaba is welcome, you know, welcome. And then Atu is something that we say uh, when you, you give somebody a hug, you haven't seen someone in quite a while, you hug them and say Atu, it kind of gives you a good vibe, you know, when you hug someone. So welcome back to the YouTube channel. Uh, thank you for clicking on it. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, I go by the name of King Anan, and um, you know I create content on how to bridge the gap between continental Africans and the African diaspora all over the world, uh, especially uh, African Americans, because I grew up in the USA since the age of 12. And one thing I've recognized over that time is that we have a lot more in common than we do, uh, the, than the differences that we've initially thought that we had in the past. You know, the differences are more of an illusion. Uh, we have so much in common, uh, all, all the black diaspora all over the world. So today in this video, I've got a very, very special uh, treat for you guys, a very, very special uh, guest of honor who's gonna grace, uh, grace the, this channel uh, with his knowledge, his background, uh, Mr. Neil Nelson. He's the CEO and founder of the Atlanta Black Star. And he's actually uh, originates from Jamaica. Uh, so we're going to talk about some interesting things. So Neil, thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. You know, I really, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, just go ahead and um, take it away. Just tell us about you, your background. Yeah, well, thank you, Brother Anand, for having me on your platform. I think the work that you're doing is uh, very commendable, and more importantly, it's needed. Right? It's thank you. It's something that that um, is essential work. You know, I've been. As you said, I was, I was born in Jamaica and growing up in Jamaica, we were very clear that the things that we knew about ourselves uh, came from Africa, at least in rural Jamaica. And, and so there was no ambiguity. We, we didn't think that we just dropped out of the sky and appeared in Jamaica. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Yeah. And we, we never for, forgot that. I think that, you know, my background, uh, Having came from Jamaica, migrated to the United States. I grew up in Western New England, which is the Northeast part of the United States in about an hour and a half west of Boston in a city called Springfield. And after living there in the cold for six years, I moved to the South to go to attend uh, college, went to a HBCU here in Atlanta, Georgia, Morse Brown College, which is founded by, uh, by Africans at the end of slavery uh, here in the South and then to educate other, other African people. And did that, I got my math degree from Morse Brown and then got my engineering degree from Georgia Tech and worked for about three years in corporate America doing global logistics for uh, the Home Depot, their, their corporate headquarters here in Atlanta. And, and didn't, didn't love it. I don't have any bad thing to say about that company, but I didn't love it because I knew that my work was, my work was to help our people uh, regain our status in the world because we had lost our status and we had lost it uh, over a very long period of time. It didn't happen all of a sudden. And so I quit after three years and became an entrepreneur. And initially that was in, I quit to do real estate, but then I realized that that's not what I wanted to do either. And so I quit that and got into the media business. And in the media business, we, we did this because we felt based on our studies that one of the three things that needed to be done for our people was a change in consciousness. And we know that content change consciousness. And so we started a media company with the mission of changing our people's conscious, both consciousness, both domestically and internationally, through through content. Wow! And that's how Atlanta Black Star uh, came to fruition. That is awesome. So you, you talk about content. What what kind of content do you um, do you have on this uh, publication, and what is your what is your mission? Certainly. So our mission at Atlanta, at Atlanta Black Star is to be one of the leading organizations to assist our people 
uh, across the globe, the global African community, to closing the knowledge, the wealth and capabilities gaps that exist between our people and other nations and, and ethnic groups around the world. And so our content consists really of all categories of, of news that people are interested in. So we, we, we cover uh, social issues, politics, entertainment, lifestyle, uh, sports, but also we, we spend a significant amount of our time, at least initially, covering the history of African people throughout the world, going back 10,000 years into uh, the most recent history. And we think that, you know, oftentimes when we talk about black history, at least in this country, there is a perception that we have to start with slavery. And we move, we, we believe that that's a distortion that, you know, uh, I was in a, a clubhouse room recently uh, and assist on, I think it was on Sunday. No, it was on, it was probably on Saturday. <clears throat> Anyways, with this weekend, and a sister came on there and she said that, you know, the attempt to expand African American history beyond slavery is erasure, is to erase. And I'm like, no, it's actually the contrary. Wow. It's, it's erasure to, to, to not extend African American or any African diaspora history mm -hmm. beyond uh, slavery, including the Caribbean, including Central South America. By the way, where most African people in the diaspora were taken into slavery, it was into the, it was in those su Southern continent, as well as Central and America and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And and to the extent that we as Africans who were taken into captivity restrain our or restrict our study of our past to just the uh, recent 500 years of our sojourn under European domination is to erase ourselves, is to erase our African identity. And to the extent that we remember and study the history of Africa prior to slavery is to reconstruct ourselves, is to remember ourselves. So the erasure only happens when you forget that you were somebody, that you were a people before we were taken into captivity, that they didn't take slaves into captivity. They took African people right. into captivity. Right. And and that's why I always I always uh, don't I, I I never want to say slaves I want to say the enslaved because they they were enslaved before they were put into captivity and that period in our history is just a small part of our history you know it's not it's not the most the the greatest part I mean obviously of our history but we come we're descendants of kings and queens and royalties I mean there were many kingdoms in African history that people don't know about you know that that they need to do their research on. So that's that's definitely an important uh, important point that you make. Um, now, being that you, you are from Jamaica, uh, you know, Jamaica is one place that I've, I've always uh, kind of kind of looked upon uh, since uh, the age of five or six, when I heard uh, the voice of the great uh, Bob Marley, who's a musical uh, idol of mine, um, coming from the, the radio of one of my uncles. You know, ever since, ever since that day, I've been drawn to Bob Marley, um, you know, and uh, on most Saturday mornings, you can find me in the kitchen cooking and listen to cooking breakfast and listen to Bob Marley. That's that's usually how I start. <laughs> I start my Saturday morning. So um, now, so there's a um, there's a line that's that's you can you can draw from Ghana to Jamaica because the enslaved were taken to uh, Jamaica. Um, and you said that you visited Ghana recently. So can you take, uh, can you tell us about uh, your trip to Ghana? Yeah, so, you know, I was in Ghana several times, um, different times. Most recently, it was August of 2019, the year of return. Okay. Um, and intended to go back last year, but then, you know, the pandemic prevented us. Right. Um, it was, it was an amazing, being in Ghana is, is amazing if you, um, A, know the history that I know, um, and and then understand who you are as an African. And, you know, we say that those of us who were brought into the Americas and elsewhere into the world to be enslaved, that we were enslaved Africans. Um, and that's different from being slaves um, because slave then r reduces you as a person as opposed to enslaved reduces the enslaver uh, as, and retains your Africanness, retains your humanity fully. And we didn't have to all be kings and queens in Africa, which to for for any any other status above slavery, 
architecture, uh, um, an architect rather, a, a gardener, uh, a, a messenger, any other role that we could play in African society is much more higher and dignified than being enslaved anywhere else in the world. Let's be Absolutely. clear about that. And so um, in Ghana though, what I saw was um, the uh, kinship of my experience in the Caribbean and also in the South here in America to uh, our people there in, in Ghana. You know, we, we rented, um, we had hired a, a, a chauffeur and, and, and rented a car who drove us across, the, across Ghana from you know Ivory Coast, the Ivory Coast, where uh, um, Kwame Nkrumah was born uh, in in a district called Elembele, all the way uh, back uh, towards um, Togo. Okay. And you know again along the coast, and it's just the most amazing experience seeing the people and talking to the people, mm. and hearing the people talk about their experience and seeing what they ate, seeing the food, seeing the the way they walk, just the disposition, seeing their facial structures. Like I was seeing myself, I was seeing my family and stuff like that. There's a name, popular names, day name in, in, in Ghana, uh, um, Kwajo. Well, in Jamaica, we say Kojo. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very common name in, in Jamaica. Um, in, in Jamaica, in, in Ghana, one of the, the, the day names is um, Kofi. We say Kofi in Jamaica. We have a very, very, com and, and the list goes on. And by the way, it's not only Jamaica, right? Oftentimes when we hear names in America, we say, oh, they're making that name up, like Lashonda or um, Hakeem and so on. No, those are not names that we're making up. Those are names that we're remembering. We're remembering them and we are spelling them given the linguistic restrictions that we have in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, but those are names that have a uh, connection to Africa. Right. Uh, the phonetics of those names are directly taken out of uh, East, I'm sorry, West Africa, um, Central Africa, and the Congo region. Those are real African retentions that our people exercise. And so right. being in Ghana for me was, was you know, uh, a brilliant experience because it reminded me and confirmed what I had studied in the literature about the, the uh, cultural continuity that existed between West Africa and the Congo and, and Africans uh, who were taken into, into the, uh, the Western hemisphere to be enslaved. Wow, uh, that's, that's quite interesting. Uh, you know, I wanna ask you about the names uh, a little bit later on, uh, but I, I do also wanna ask you this. Uh, there's a huge, there's a, there are a lot of Jamaicans in Ghana. Uh, some who I've, have resettled from Jamaica over the years. Um, as a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Bob Marley's wife, Rita, I think she resides in Ghana. And mm -hmm. at, at some point, I, I heard rumors that um, uh, Bob Marley's remains had been exhumed and taken to Ghana. That could be wrong. You know, I'm not really sure. But yeah. you know, I've, I've heard. She wanted to do it, but mm -hmm. the government of Jamaica uh, um, uh, designated Bob Marley's remains to be uh, a national treasure. Okay. And therefore, uh, restricted her from doing that. Okay. Um, interestingly, when I was there in August, um, I met up with Bob Marley's granddaughter, who was there to visit her grandmother. Okay. And, and we had a, you know, um, her name is Denisha, and we had a really good conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah, there's, a, there's many Jamaicans and many Africans from the diaspora in Ghana. Yeah. For sure. I, I believe there's a, a community of Jamaicans who reside in like one one specific area. Did you go to that area? I can't really remember where. It might be in the eastern region, if I'm not mistaken. But um, I, I know. <laughs> I did not go. I did not go to that region. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that there are there's such a, there are places in the in the in Ghana where many uh, Jamaicans um, uh, congregate for sure. Okay. Okay. Okay, folks, um, if you're enjoying this content, please make sure that you give this video a big thumbs up uh, so the algorithm can push it out and, you know, show it to other people just like you who enjoy this type of content. Uh, make sure you're clicking the notification bell so anytime I upload a new video, just like this one, you can get notified. And share this content with your loved ones, with your friends and family, because sharing is caring. And um, 
please consider subscribing to this video only if you like this content. If you don't like it, that's okay, but <laughs> go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Now in Ghana, uh, when you were there, you know, we all got to eat, you know, Africans, we like our food. You know, Jamaicans, you guys like your food. I, I know there's certain similarities between the food in Jamaica and the food in Ghana. So okay, describe that. Yeah, I mean, it's, there, there are many similarities. The, my favorite is, is the yam. So in Jamaica, mm. where I grew up in, in rural Jamaica, yam was yam and rice are the number one, uh, number, one number one and two favorite um, dishes uh, mm -hmm. for us. Um, and in Ghana, that was also the case. And um, and fish. And um, we have a, a favorite drink in the holiday season, December, called sorrel in Jamaica. Um, I think in, in Ghana, you have a name for it. It's um, bolo something or something of that nature. But it's, it's, it's biscuit plant that is boiled into a red um, uh, flavored uh, juice. Okay. Um, that you guys in Ghana, it's it's made with uh, gin, ginger and the pineapple juice. Mm. In it's called, I think it's called sobolo. It's called sobolo. Um, okay. Yeah, I know. I know you're. Yeah, I know you. Yeah, yeah sobolo. We call it sorrel in Jamaica, and and we make it the same way. We use cane sugar instead of pineapple juice sometimes, but it's the same thing, right? And uh, and the yam. Is cooked the same way in Jamaica. We we have a, several yams that we we eat, mm -hmm. um, and it's a very common thing across West Africa. The yam diet, right? And so, being in Ghana, eating yam, cassava, um, fish, and and it's the, the various sauces. It was like being back home. Mm -hmm. I, I could eat yam any day, any time of the day, with fish and and the different sauce. So, mm -hmm. interestingly. When I was in Ghana, I met a brother um, who owns a restaurant, one here in Atlanta and one in um, in Ghana. And since I came back, I've been eating at that restaurant what, on a weekly what's basis. The name of it? It's called Ike's, Ike's Cafe. Yeah, I've been there. So, I've been to the one in Atlanta. Yes, yes, yes. So Ike <laughs> in Atlanta, and he has one in the uh, in the Ashanti region of, yeah. um, of Ghana as well, because yeah, he, he's yeah. an Ashanti. So, um, so yeah, the food next is amazing. Time, next time I come up there to Atlanta, we, we definitely got to go and eat some fufu. Oh, for I, sure. I don't know if you like fufu or not, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not my there. favorite. The yam is my favorite. The uh -huh. yam is my favorite. Um, but yeah, we had that too. Um, and it was, you know, again, we drove across the entire um, coastal region um, and it was just amazing. That's great. That's great. Yeah, and I, I enjoy Jamaican food too. You know, I like the oxtails, you know, the... Um, you know, beef patties, and you guys, you guys also do plantain. So yeah, there's there's a, a Jamaican restaurant near uh, where I live, but it's it's a little expensive because that's the only one here. They don't mm. have any competition. So you know, every once in a while, you know, I'll go and um, partake of their of their food. Um, now you you mentioned actually that you grew up in Springfield, right? Yeah, it's it's one thing I'm I meant to. Uh, mentioned to you when we uh when we got introduced to each other that i also grew up in massachusetts oh wow I, yeah i grew up outside boston so the first five years of when i lived in the states you know i, I grew up in massachusetts and then i moved to virginia to go to uh, to go to college mm. so and i've actually been to springfield before the uh, basketball hall of fame i visited yes. um that um at once so yeah it's um only only thing i didn't like about massachusetts is the cold of course <laughs> It's yeah. definitely an ice box. It's definitely yeah. an ice box. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm a I'm a tropical kind of person because that's that's where I was born. So I can't I can't stand the cold. Same. Uh, Same. Yeah. So th this is this is something I really wanted to I found really interesting in doing my research in Jamaica and what I've known about Jamaica in the past is that um uh there was um I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the comic Luke Cage. But yeah, so there was a, this show on Netflix a couple years mm -hmm. ago yeah. where uh, there was this really, really interesting character, uh, a bad guy by the name of Bushmaster. Uh, you familiar? No. Oh, OK. So he was a villain. He was a villain in, the, um, in Luke Cage. And apparently Bushmaster had a brother in Jamaica who was a, a criminal. And uh, his brother died and he took he took on. The persona of his brother and moved to the states and and started a crime syndicate. So the backstory of Bushmaster, he was telling the story about 
about growing up in the hills and the mountains of, of some town in Jamaica. And he was telling the story of Nanny, who was a, a con woman from Ghana who led a slave revolt. I don't know how much you know about that, but can you share anything about, about that? Yeah, so um, uh, Queen Nanny is actually a, a national hero in, in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So everyone who's Jamaican or uh, knows about Nanny, um, just like Marcus Garvey internationally. And so um, Nanny and her brother, Kojo, <laughs> no surprise there, were uh, leaders of one of the um, African uh, sects in Jamaica that had, uh, were brought to Jamaica to be enslaved by the British and fled the plantation almost immediately and started um, one of the, um, one of the communi communities, free communities in Jamaica and waged relentless war against the British until the British had to acknowledge that they were free and stop um, trying to reconquer them and, and such. Now, what's interesting about, about Jamaica though, let me say this, is that Jamaican um, history um, during the, the enslavement period is one in which there was an uprising in Jamaica every two years. Like when you study the detailed history, um, and that's a part of what, one of the things that the, it was so, it was so extreme that the British banned taking Africans as slaves from certain parts of West Africa wow. because of how um, uh, the warrior spirit of the people in Jamaica. Dr. Tenery Clark, one of our scholars here, historic historians here, said that you know Jamaica had more uprising than any other place in the hemisphere. Mm. However, they were not able to coalesce and bring those different factions together the way they did in Haiti and parts of Brazil to establish states mm -hmm. uh, as early as, as you know, the, the 17th or the 18th century um, or, or, or really early 19th century. And so that's, that's the distinction there, but the, the warrior spirit that came out of that region of, of, the, of, the, um, of West Africa was, was present not only in Nani and her brother Kojo, but was also present in across the island. In fact, one of the first uprisings in the hemisphere happened in Jamaica in, in an area where I was born, in, in the parish of Clarendon, where the Africans were, were taken into uh, slavery there and were uh, being held captive, rose up one morning and killed all the white people in the area and fled to the, the, the hills. Mm -hmm. And they were one of the first community to be freed in, the, in Jamaica. Uh, just on the strength of, you know, we're not going to accept this. This is not a part of the contract that we sign with anybody to be your slave perpetually. And so that spirit is there. And to a great extent, Jamaica, as, long, as well as Haiti and other places, have retained significantly more of the culture of Africa intact. When I was a kid in Jamaica, a child in Jamaica, rather, growing up in the, in the 80s, we didn't have television. We didn't have um, electrical lighting and, and power. So we, you know, we were in a village mm -hmm. and our entertainment came from my grandmother and my eldest uncle sitting on the veranda of, of our home and telling us uh, Anansi stories, Kwaku Anansi stories every night yeah. for hours. Um, and there were other stories too. There were biblical stories, but there are also stories about uh, the enslavement of our people in, in Jamaica, but the, the Anansi stories, almost every Jamaican knows that. And that speaks to, I think, the connection between uh, Africans in the diaspora, specifically in Jamaica, and uh, the, uh, the Akan, perhaps even more so, the Ashanti um, region of Jamaica. And if, you, if, you've ever, if you've ever gone to, gone and see Ashanti, you see on their faces the same representation that you see right. uh, in Jamaica, and, and also some places in the South here too. Right. You see the same physical appearance of folks like, oh, that person is definitely Ashanti. Right. And that right. person Absolutely. is definitely from. Yeah. And that's that's why I tell a lot of, um, you know, black people here that when they go to Africa, it's 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 like looking in a mirror because you're going to see a reflection of yourself. And Absolutely. Your brother and your sister, you're going to see because when, when I first came to the States, I didn't go back to Ghana for 13 years. So when I went back. And I saw the people there and I saw the resemblances of other people here in America. 
that had that I was looking at, I was like, oh, okay. So I see the connections now. I really understand, yeah, you know, yeah. the connections. And it, it's funny you should say that. I mean, you had mentioned that before when we spoke previously about the Anansi stories. That's something that a lot of Ghanaians know about because those are stories that we either read about or, you know, or were told by, like you said, your grandmother or your grandfather. You know, I can remember uh, probably my love of reading started just by reading the Anansi stories when I was about four or five. You know, I could, you know, when you when you first told me about that, you know, I had a vision in my mind of me sitting in our little modest home in second D in the western region of Ghana, reading mm. the Anansi story. So yeah, Anansi was basically a man who who had been turned into a spider by by uh, Nyami, which is uh, the sky god. Nyami is, is God in the Akan language. Mm. And you know, he had so many stories. He's the he's the master of stories. He, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, some people say he was a trickster also. You know, he could trick you into doing anything. So that's um that's that's definitely another connection, another thread that's that's woven through you know our history. And also um women women historically from Africa, like Ya Sansua, uh, you know, obviously Nanny uh, have been really powerful and, and rebellious. And that rebellious spirit lies within every single one of us Africans. You know, it's been lying dormant, but you know, we, we need to we need to awaken that spirit. Um, now you, you, when you were talking about, um, about, uh, I'm sorry, Nanny, right? Queen Nanny, that's, she's of the Maroons, right? Yes. So there are different, there were different, uh, Maroon, uh, encampments in, in Jamaica. So mm -hmm. she, she, she had one that she belonged to, but there were other ones as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, if yeah. you, um, if you have time to check out the uh, that show Luke Cage on Netflix, I'd really recommend that you check it out because uh, it's really really interesting. Uh, Bushmaster was a really interesting character, and I, I learned uh, some some things about Jamaica that I didn't I didn't even know before. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, and uh, in regard to the names, yeah, I was doing some research, and also another uh, another man that I learned about is uh, I think he was believed he was called Taki. Yeah, Taki. Right, and he was yeah. also of the Akan tribe, and and in Ghana, there's a a pretty common name called Techi. Techi in Ghana, and that's the same. I guess when it got to Jamaica, they started calling it uh, Taki. So that's that's really really interesting. And yeah. um, I actually found out that the Bob Marley song "Redemption" uh, Redemption song was really about uh, Queen Nanny and other other women who actually led slave uprisings. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar about with that or not, but- um, Not that particular um, interpretation of it, but I, I will say that Redemption Song, the way we understood it, at least me, is that it was about African people, mm -hmm. period, men and women fighting for liberation against, um, uh, slavery against oppression, against uh, European imperialism of the African world. Uh, Bob Marley has a, has a very, you know, as, a, as an extensive um, list of songs that deal with uh, struggle, and right. that's why he's, you know, one of the reasons why he's he's so well celebrated across the world is because he speaks to the plight of the of the so-called um, uh, third world or the South. Uh, against European imperialism mm -hmm. uh, in that era and, and and to this day, so I think he he makes that connection. Then also he has a spiritual Rasta Rasta uh, connection as well. I think those two uh, reasons are are why he's so well known still and, and is respected because people are still engaging in struggle and and are celebrating the history of struggle that it has brought us to this point so far. I want to say about about Taki and people. You know, another person that's that's not well known is that the the priest, one of the priests that set off the revolution in Haiti, his name was Bookman, or they called him also Dutty Bookman, mm -hmm. um, was taken from Jamaica um, and and came to Haiti, and it was in Haiti that he actually helped set off the revolution there that spawned that sparked uh, much uprising even here in North America. When Africans who that were who were enslaved here in North America were hearing the stories of what was happening in Haiti, they themselves began to uh, to up to rise up against against the, the the wicked slave master, 
you know, in that room that we were on the other night with Brother uh, Emmanuel, who we, who we mutually know, that one of the brothers came on there uh, and said that, you know, no one in the African world has done anything to help that has impacted and help um, African Americans. Well, actually, the Asian Revolution uh, uh, did that mm -hmm. um, uh, because that revolution made white folks really scared that this might be coming to a town near you, and so it 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 pushed them all over the world to move towards. Um, to move towards ending shadow slavery. And I, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I, I want to say, yeah. I want to say a few things if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Not. The floor. I want to say that we have to remember the long history of African people. Mm. And the long history actually um, precedes Akan history, Ashanti history, it precedes Yoruba history, it precedes uh, Zulu history, it precedes all of the history that we talk about today, both on the continent and in the diaspora, that we are linked as African people because our, our connection goes back at least 10,000 years. And I like what Dr. Chancellor Williams says in his book, The Destruction of Black, Civiliz of Black Civilization, that at one point, all African people on the continent, or at least the vast majority of us, understood that we belong to what he said was a great Ethiopian empire that stretched from what is today called the Indian Ocean all the way uh, west into, into what is the Atlantic Ocean mm -hmm. and all the way north to the Mediterranean Sea. And that we knew that we belonged to that and we had different states that emerged in that empire at different times. And this idea is not lost on the people who came into Africa first and began to enslave Africans at a significant number, the Arabs. When the Arabs came to Africa, they recognized that from as far west as the Atlantic to as far east as the Indian Ocean or the Red Sea, they called much of that land Balad al-Sudan, the land of the Blacks. This idea that blackness as a, as a terminology for identifying African people is something that came out of the American uh, experience of enslaving our, our people here right. is completely fictional. We have been saying this about ourselves and the world has been saying this about ourselves, about us, that we are black people, that we are this people, that the Greeks said were uh, kissed by the sun. Our African ancestors didn't say that we were kissed by the sun. They say that we were blessed by the sun. And it is, it is our connection with the sun is something that Dr. Chancellor Williams said that when the Greeks and, and the others began to come into Africa and to take possession of at least the Northern part of the Nile Valley, Southern uh, Lower Egypt, our people would migrate in hundreds of thousands. One of the books that I just completed uh, last year as a book by a German scholar uh, it's called um, Researches into the uh, Political Intercourse and Culture of the Carthaginians, Ethiopians, and Egyptians. He said that- oh, That's a mouthful. When, <laughs> yes. <laughs> he said, when, the, when these folks begin to come into the Nile, who are, uh, we know as, as, as white people or Eurasians, at one time, over a quarter million of the warriors left and went into what is today Sudan, with their families and others, because they refused to come under dominion of these foreigners who didn't look like them. Our people valued being black. Our people value uh, having this relationship with the sun and with the earth and with nature and did not want to dilute that uh, at all. Mm -hmm. And so they moved further south into Mother Africa. And when our people were brought into the Americas to be enslaved, we fought up and down the entire hemisphere to be free from white oppression and to be separate from white people. When our people took power in Haiti, they they didn't just took power and said, "Oh, let's all you know, let's, let's live together." No, they slaughtered the oppressors, and 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 only gave sanction to those who had given sanction to them in return. The same thing happened in Brazil, in Palenque, and other places in in Mexico. When our people took their freedom from the oppressor,
They did so to restore a semblance of being African again. Our journey to freedom is a journey back to being fully African, is to remembering our African ancestry, to restore our African consciousness. Dr. Amos Wilson says in his book, The Blueprint for Black Power, that the, the, the platform upon which black people in this country, in America, he was writing for black America in this book primarily, but also generally for the, Afri for the entire African world. He said that it is an African centered consciousness that will allow African Americans to achieve their full liberation from white domination and white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Anything short of that, then you will still be oppressed and still be enslaved. No matter what you call yourself, if you have not retained full African consciousness, you will not retain full freedom as an African person. And by the way, that also goes for our brothers and sisters on the continent. To a great extent, our people on the continent have lost and have forgotten the long history. They have forgotten the long history. And because of colonization, most have even forgotten the short history of who their own ethnic nations are. We have to restore that history, not only here in the Americas, but all throughout the African world, and especially on the continent, because it is that shared history that will bind us together and restore our place in the sun. Ooh, that gave me chills, brother. <laughs> True words have never been spoken. Uh, that was powerful. And on that note, we're gonna end uh, this amazing conversation here. I really, really appreciate your time, brother, because I know you got a busy schedule. Uh, but I just want to add, I just want to say this. Um, I'm going to actually uh, put your link for the Atlanta uh, Black Star um, in, the, um, in the description so uh, anyone can check it out. And also, uh, do you have any uh, socials that you want to share on uh, your social media? Yeah, certainly. I think that on the website, there are links to our social uh, media handle angles on Facebook and, and Twitter and uh, YouTube as well, and also on Instagram. Um, I think it's uh, it's at ATL Black Star um, is the is the angle for for the publication. Awesome, awesome. All right, guys. So thank you so much, so much for checking out this video. If you made it to the end, I appreciate you. You're awesome. Please make sure that you're giving this video a big thumbs up, share it with your friends and family click the notification bell. And if you like this type of content, I'm going to be bringing you some more amazing conversations with brothers just like uh, Neil and also sisters in the diaspora. So thank you again for checking out this video. Uh, make sure that uh, you're subscribing to the channel if you're enjoying this content. Uh, before we go, I just want to leave you with this one thought. Uh, not all Black people will stick together, but the ones who do will be the ones who build the future. So on that note, uh, on behalf of Neil, and uh, this is King Anand, uh, we're King Anand Ghana. We're bridging a gap between continental Africans and the African diaspora all over the world. And I'll see you on the next video.